Bien. Nous allons reprendre. We are now going to resume. And of course, as I pointed out beforehand, uh, it's time and we try to be punctual at the Academy. Allow me now to open this session by announcing the inaugural lecture given this year by Judge Dominique Acher in French, as you have understood. And because it's in French, I am introducing him in French. So a few way, words by way of introduction. Our guest studied at the Paris II University, but he also studied at the Harvard Law School because he had a fellowship at the time. And in 1999, he administered a lecture at the International Academy. He, at the time, it was in another building. And some of you who are here may remember it. And Mr. Stroiken, I believe that uh, you were responsible for this auditorium within our ranks. We have the presence of the person who was responsible for this building. So 1999, a course given by our guest at the Academy on the procedural practices in international uh, uh, commercial law during the private uh, international law courses. Um, he has been a professor all over the place in France and the USA at the Panthéon Sorbonne Paris 1 University, although he actually studied at Paris 2, uh, university professor at uh, uh, the Texas School of Law and also in the UK at uh, University College of London. London. Dominique Asher is also has also been uh, president of uh, Comparative Law Association and is advisory member of the governing board of the Council of Administration, member of the American Law Institute, elected in 2007, secretary general of the French branch of the International Law Association that you're all familiar with. Judge Asher is a practitioner, as you have no doubt realized, he's not just a professor, he's a practitioner and worked for the French Judicial Services in 1981, was seconded as a legal advisor at the International Court of Arbitration of the International uh, Chamber of uh, Commerce and was uh, then appointed as advisor at the Court of Cassation. So you can see that he has a very broad view when it comes to arbitration, and he will now offer his insights. Thank you very much for being with us, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much for having come here to listen to this lecture, which will be given in French and uh, following what uh, the Secretary General has said. I'm not asking you to go back to 1923, but we're going to focus on the review of arbitral awards, and I'm going to project you, send you into the future. So the review bodies for awards, be they national or not national, and I'll immediately exclude the International Court of Justice, uh, in fact, uh, have the aim of stabilizing arbitral justice by ensuring the integrity of awards and vouching for the integrity of the arbitration systems in which the award was delivered the importance of the missions given to the arbitral tribunals, uh, whose decisions very often have an impact over and beyond the disputes to be resolved, and especially in a context where arbitration has become the usual mode uh, to settle and resolve international disputes, all of this underscores the gravity of their mission, the mission of these review bodies. So when we speak about review of awards, this is a relatively narrow uh, domain, and very often interventions involve a limited number of uh, players. Nonetheless, so during this lecture, 
along the way, I would like to encourage you to give thought to, to the regulation of an international system of justice via arbitration. So how do these review bodies establish connections between national and international legal orders in order to review awards, passing them from one legal order to another? Their ability to mobilize uh, principles deriving from uh, a plurality of legal orders is indicative of their strengths and weaknesses in the accomplishment of their mission. And indeed, in the international order, there are many sub-orders in networks, interstate international legal order, uh, transnational legal order, um, the Lex Mercatoria, the legal order of international trade, etc. No matter what the composition of these legal orders may be, and this varies according to uh, doctrinal constructions, we're talking about pluriverses which coexist and crisscross and are not arranged in a hierarchical order. I wouldn't like to confine myself to a particular category or give a definition of international law, because in fact, that would make it impossible to discuss the composite character of international law, which is the product of review bodies. And it would be, in fact, uh, breaking the dynamics. Um, subjecting an award to international law, in fact, uh, gives rise to an award in that light. So this is the topology I'd like to present in order to focus on these awards based on international law. The arbitral procedure is not the place where international law can most specifically be seen in arbitration. There are many rules of procedure which uh, derive from international law without that necessarily mean that international law controls the award. For my part, I would rather focus on the rules which apply to the disputes because uh, the freedom of choice allows for the application of uh, the rules of international law, be it in the contracts of international trade with the Lex Mercatoria, in uh, sports disputes with the Lex Sportiva, or again in disputes pertaining to investments. Their application is marked by the decompartmentalization and extension. An exit award thereby identifies a general principle of international law in the provisions of the UNIDRA principles regarding the exemption of responsibility. More broadly, nothing uh, rules out the choice of public international law as uh, contract law or concurrently with a domestic law. One of uh, the main awards in international law, Texaco against Libya, delivered in uh, 1977, uh, says that international uh, law, in fact, uh, is important. And uh, in fact, the parties are sometimes given the ability to choose uh, the applicable law. And this corresponds to theories which have been developed for specific reasons to internationalize the contract and justify that an investor be seen as uh, a player in public international law. And since uh, the Texaco Award, uh, this has been accepted and many international conventions protect investment through international law. Some investment protection treaties even stipulate clauses of applicable law, which in addition to the provisions of the treaty and the law of the host state, mention the principles of international law. In any event, um, for arbitral case law, a treaty is not uh, a closed system, but must be seen in a broader context involving rules deriving from other sources. The Washington Convention of the 18th of March 1965 on the settlement of disputes between uh, states and the 
nationals of other states, uh, ICSID, uh, establishes the basis of an arbitration system which is organized and which leads to the application of international law. Article 42 of the Convention directs arbitrators towards uh, the principles of international law applicable in this area, which refers to the sources of international law, such as identified in Article 38.1 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice. Jurisdiction is broadly made subject to international law through the arbitral case law of ICSID. The review of awards, of arbitral awards, can only occur on the basis of the rules of international law incumbent on arbitrators. All international law, which is primarily supplementary, cannot serve to review awards. All violations of international law are not uh, violations of substantive public policy, as is recalled by the Swiss Federal Tribunal. That does not uh, rule out the imperative nature of some of these rules, um, encouraged by legal teachings, uh, inter alia, the Institute of International Law, Arbitral case law states bluntly the need to comply with the principles of international law, which are of an imperative nature, be it in international trade law or investment law. Thus, in arbitral case law, you have the security of transactions, which is deemed to be a public, uh, pol public policy principle of the Lex Mectoria, good faith, a common principle of public policy at transnational level, and the principles, the just cogence principles of international arbitration. The principles of execution in good faith of conventions, Pacta Sunt Savanta, are protected by public policy uh, as uh, French and Swiss case law illustrates. Now, the application of international law in the review is not uh, carried out purely and simply. There are other sources which intervene, such as the substantive rules which transpose the rules of the arbitral legal order in the arbitration law of the court or forum when it comes into alia uh, to the composition of the arbitral tribunal or the arbitration agreement. But I don't actually want to dwell on those rules because that's a question of method. What I'd like to say is that the contractual basis of arbitration, even when we're dealing with an investment case, does not remove anything from the force of international law. In the Duke versus Peru case, the ad hoc uh, ICSID committee, in order to answer the accusations leveled at the arbitrators for having set aside Peruvian law applicable to the impugned contract in order to interpret the arbitration clause, evoked uh, the general principles of good faith and the will of the parties. So, although subjecting arbitral jurisdiction to a rule rooted in international law follows a certain logic for, uh, as far as an ad hoc committee is concerned, uh, because of its role as a guarantor of exit arbitration, the application of international law is more noteworthy when the matter needs to be made subject to the law designated by the rules of the choice of law of the forum namely the national judge. The agreement between the investment, investor sorry, and the state to arbitrate an investment dispute, although based uh, on the uh, provisions of a BIT, is not nonetheless a treaty between the parties to arbitration. Nonetheless, as is said by the British judge in the case Occidental versus uh, Republic of uh, Ecuador, it obeys international law. The same trend in favor of international law can be found in the case law of the Swiss Federal Tribunal regarding the provisions in respect of the European Energy Charter. And uh, this is designated by private international law rules. From these last two decisions, we can see that the monist dualist distinction is no longer a clear line because there are so many ways of incorporating international law into domestic law. The federal tribunal does not accept the direct application of international 
law and reasons on the basis of Article 178 of the SPILA, like for a conflict of laws, to apply the energy charter as an element of Swiss law. So it's somewhat complicated, but this demonstration is nonetheless satisfactory. And uh, although the English judgment I just mentioned refers uh, to designate the applicable law uh, to the protection treaty between Ecuador and the USA, which uh, not having been ratified by the UK wasn't incorporated into English legal order, the English Court of Appeal dismissed any uh, mechanistic approach to which in which something will always be missing to take this any further, even if you refer to the technique of conflict of laws. Each one has the responsibility to maintain the balance of the international justice system, and one shouldn't, in fact, become too formalistic, uh, even if it's that of private international law. When there is a rule which is provided by various sources with the possibility of different shades of meanings and contents, that in fact confers flexibility to whoever applies the rule, which in fact uh, removes them from a mechanical application which would limit them to a single source. The appeal of international law must also be felt for the review of awards uh, delivered in investment arbitration based on domestic law. And and uh, otherwise, how can would one uh, favor a harmonizing approach when the principle is the absence of uh, uh, a review uh, by the ordinary courts? Now, domestic laws on investment have a more or less uniform content with notions, in fact, which overlap with those used in treaties. Therefore, it's not uh, exact that the application of international norms solely depends on the national or international source of the protection as uh, uh, said the British court, as the British court said, when a domestic law affords uh, or ensures the protection of investors, it takes a place in international relations. Um, the review bodies, uh, therefore, are encouraged to place their solutions under the banner of international law. The attractiveness of international law in review operations is best explained by accepting that the function of international law in this context is not the same as its function in relations among states, um, while its role here is uh, no different uh, from that uh, of a foreign law, the substitution of international law for national law, as did the previous courts, shows that the international legal order which gave rise to this sentence cannot be disregarded, and its uh, objectives and consistency are better preserved than with the application of national law. The fact that international law does not always have the same nature is not a problem, therefore. The review should be necessary to, in order to avoid anything which might disrupt uh, a peaceful international legal order. To restore harmony, the review bodies have uh, global legal instruments, the New York Convention of 1958 on the recognition and execution of foreign arbitral set, uh, awards, or the Washington Convention of Exid, none of them, none of which, sorry, allows them to review the judgment of the arbitrators. Now, international law can also be involved in the review of an award which was not submitted to it, as we will see when it comes to public policy. A more conquering international law, nonetheless, should not be the cause of excesses. The weight of international law should not turn into a restriction of arbitrators' freedom. The moment an arbitral legal order has been recognized, it should be given a free hand in all the areas which, there are, which do not need to be reviewed. But 
is a discrete international law, even in the case of a criticism of a violation of public policy, is still appropriate today? And therefore, can we ask ourselves whether international law can focus on the merits? We're now going to look at the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, treaties of uh, 1969 as an investigation tool to balance the review and proportionality as a methodological tool, more specifically, when dealing with uh, financial penalties and uh, a violation of public policy. The Vienna Convention, which uh, represents a codification of international custom, applies uh, to the interpretation of all treaties, no matter what the state of ratifications may be, including by the forum. Equating a treaty to which uh, the forum is not a party with uh, a foreign law whose interpretation by the courts is sovereign, to, sovereign does not take into consideration the fact that you can give a treaty a meaning which may run counter to international law. Such a solution would also reflect a lack of responsibility by refusing to adopt a universal application of the principles of good governance which manage investments and shape international economic economic relations. The case law of the main European countries, which are the seat of investment arbitrations, shows that uh, the use of the Vienna Convention to interpret the clauses of the treaty keeps the review within the authorized limits of jurisdiction without encroaching on the merits. Uh, the, the lines of control, therefore, are not modified with the invention, intervention sorry, of the Vienna Convention, which proves to be uh, very useful for the understanding of the treaties and the classification of their provisions in the light of uh, the opening of cases of review. However, in the lack, with the lack, sorry, of a legal mechanism, how can you avoid different national interpretations of international conventions? Uh, seeking a consistent interpretation makes it more important, makes it all the more important to have a comparative uh, reasoning. A consensus, nonetheless, is not always reached. Therefore, in uh, the same case, for the same award, uh, the misuse of the act uh, to act before the investment treaty is seen as a matter of admissibility by the British court and therefore cannot be subject to review, but as an issue of jurisdiction by the French court, which sees uh, a fraud in the artificial um, collection of the conditions to be fulfilled. So the domestic uh, judges should try to interpret treaties as if they were international judges, which would be particularly necessary for the higher courts, which by their regulatory action deepen the review and uh, unify it. I would now like to focus on proportionality, which is a common uh, principle to national legal systems and which can be identified as such in many international suborders in the WTO, the European um, Union, the ECHR, etc. And arbitral case law on investments also uses this as a method of interpretation, for example, for exclusion clauses, expropriation, or again, the fair and equitable treatment principle. Proportionality is a general principle of law, but it's also an interpretation technique. Unless the arbitrator misrepents the facts, it's difficult to characterize an interpretation as an excess of power or a breach of public policy. The application of proportionality by the arbitral tribunal, therefore, is difficult to review because very quickly we start dealing with the merits, which in principle cannot be reviewed. Can we slide towards the merits so when the award is reviewed by using proportionality? Are there any examples of that? But with proportionality, it's not a question of overturning solutions, even the best acquired ones. The methodological usefulness of proportionality mustn't be disregarded to deal with the public policy objection. 
annulment or the refusal of the exequatur of an award constitutes an interference in the right to, to the effective execution of uh, decisions of law as an aspect of the right to a fair trial. This no doubt is not an absolute uh, right, but the breach must be proportionate and legitimate, having regard to the violations of public policy. The Swiss uh, Federal Court gives us an example regarding the compatibility of a disciplinary sanction imposed in a sports arbitration with public policy. And uh, according to the court, uh, constitutes a breach of personal rights, which is extremely serious and uh, disproportionate with the behavior being sanctioned. I'd like to recall that when it comes to financial penalties, which are certainly the most frequent in arbitration, that uh, the obligation to afford restitutio in integrum, albeit uh, a principle which sets out to, to avoid a uh, double compensation is not a fundamental principle. An order to pay punitive damages, therefore, is not or does not run counter to international public order per se, unless the amount awarded is disproportionate, having regard to the harm sustained and the breach of contractual obligations of the debtor as was said by the Court of Cassation in France. Nonetheless, this is not an invitation to revisit the amount of the fine handed down uh, in the light of the debtor's ability to pay, but uh, one should ascertain whether this penalty has been weighed up um, in the light of the contractual breach, having regard to the circumstances of the case. The right to respect for property is an essential value protected by international public order and by the fundamental laws. The claim for compensation in the estate of the recipient of the award uh, is therefore property which is protected um, and uh, any uh, act of non-recognition must be proportionate. Public policy has always emphasized the fight against corruption, trafficking uh, of influence and money laundering as we can see when we look at arbitral case law. Uh, the condemnation of such conduct uh, is based on a general principle of the unlawful nature of corruption in the Lex Mercatoria in international law, or is expressed in several international conventions. Although the latter are not of direct application, the values uh, they protect are no doubt essential for the legal order of the forum of the execution of the award. Um, the review of corruption as uh, it occurs before certain courts uh, does away with the distinction between the review of public policy and the substantive review. International law in no way dictates uh, reviewing the exact the, the correction of the award like in appeal. It's uh, via an appeal that uh, uh, against an award that the judge must undertake an, any assessment and not directly as an arbitrator would do. The relevant questions are the following. Does the award give the right uh, to compensation to the party who is accused of unlawful conduct and does that infringe the right to respect of property of the party ordered to pay compensation and can the latter claim uh, that um, conversely the uh, non-recognition of the award, doesn't it violate the right to respect for property? In his reply, the judge will examine the respective behaviour of the parties to assess whether the breach of the right to respect for property is legitimate and proportionate. The unlawful conduct of the investor and the public authorities, accomplices of the host, host state, is used as a link between the breach of the right of respect to property and the violation of public policy. Therefore, the imperative nature of norms is reduced with proportionality in order to, in fact, avoid a review 
of uh, the merits of the award as a technique which reconciles legal systems, proportionality is an encouragement to hold a dialogue amongst courts. But these uh, courts must be amenable to dialogue, which is not possible if you defend a political stance. And I would now like to speak about the limitations of international law. The European Court of Justice has uh, destroyed the arbitrability of disputes based on investment protection treaties as being counter or running counter rather to European treaties, uh, regardless of whether or not the EU role, the EU law plays a role in resolving the dispute. Various grounds are put forward, ranging from the absence of uh, a legal mechanism for an arbitral tribunal, whereas the interpretation of the law of a member state is always like to be able to give rise to an interpretation of European law. Uh, and uh, the compulsory nature for EU courts and uh, the EU, in fact, uh, uh, cannot therefore focus on that. And therefore, you come out of international law to prohibit arbitration because of EU law. Therefore, the European Court of Justice has decided that only the courts approved by it can or are entitled to apply European law. Its case law changes previous balances and sends us back to the times when arbitrators had been prohibited from applying the rules of public policy. No legal system, in fact, uh, prohibits others from applying its rules because no rules are more worthy than others, especially as community law especially raises questions relating to economic regulation or regulation, which makes them unfit for universal recognition, as was said on several occasions by the Swiss court. So international law uh, dictates uh, dissidence rather than respect uh, uh, EU, uh, regarding European law. I'd like to refer to the Mikula case, the execution of an exit award delivered on the basis of BIT between Sweden and Romania for the European Commission amounted to granting uh, state assistance in breach of uh, the EU treaty. Romania had been, in fact, uh, ordered uh, uh, or oh, sorry, prohibited from satisfying the investor. Romania, nonetheless, uh, had to pay compensation to the investor and was under a different obligation, namely to give um, effect to the award pursuant to Article 53 of the Washington Convention. The English uh, judge was duty-bound to implement uh, Article 54 of the same convention which ordered the contracting states to ensure the execution on their territory of pecuniary obligations. Romania, which proposed interpreting the ICSID convention in the light of EU law in order to comply with this uh, principle, but the British uh, court put forward the principles of interpretation of international law and uh, said that uh, an international commitment of the UK was above EU law. This is a reasoning which the European Commission couldn't accept, and it opened infringement proceedings against the UK. By avoiding any discussion on the role of respective uh, uh, international sources, the European Court of Justice, in fact, comes out of my scope of uh, studies. And because uh, they are a source of law in all legal systems, uh, the review must be based on principles which are universally recognized. Um, and uh, these must be raised to the rank of principles of international law by way of a common language. And this is the last uh, slide that I would now like to focus on the role of international law in a review. And because of its universalist postulate, we have seen that uh, international human rights uh, law are conducive uh, to a dialogue amongst uh, judges. And the most illustrative is to start with fundamental rights to illustrate the respect for federating values. The review of awards, in fact, um, 
uh, has to be upheld. Is it more difficult for an ad hoc committee acting under the auspices of the Washington Convention to apply international human rights law? Apart from one particular ad hoc committee, which didn't know what to do on the pretext uh, that um, uh, this is of a limited usefulness, we can see that uh, the ad hoc committee in the case FAPO against the Philippines invoked the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the International Government on Civil and Political uh, Rights and the ECHR and fundamental liberties. And referring to the decision of this committee, another referred to treaties on human rights as a source of the contents of the right to be heard, protected by the Washington Convention, recognizing that even if committees act within the ICSID Convention, the reference to the jurisprudence of specialized courts um, in fact, strengthens the effectiveness of the concept of the right to be heard. It also enhances the legitimacy of the interpretation by linking it to the broader body of international law. But it was the ad hoc committee in the case Tulip against uh, Turkey, which in its decision made the introduction of text on human rights more systematic by referring to Article 313C of the Vienna Convention, I'll mention that in a moment, in order to ensure the existence of a fair trial and reasoning in the award. And of course, there are also ad hoc committees which base themselves on the principle of the international right to an independent and impartial judge to extend the review of the Convention of Washington beyond the composition of the tribunal to cover independence and the impartiality of arbitrators as well. Although it is true that human rights do not set out to protect investments and that arbitral tribunals can only decide having regard to investment protection treaties which confer jurisdiction to them, nonetheless, the investors are not disregarded. And we have already seen, well, first of all, you need to draw a distinction between the jurisdiction and applicable law. And we've already seen that a treaty cannot be considered in isolation from international law. The infringements of property, legal certainty, and the predictability of law, the protection of one of reputation and private life, non-discrimination and the prohibition, prohibition sorry, of the denial of justice um, all express many values common to a plurality of legal orders as well as to the investment law in terms of appropriation, most favorable nation clause, legal expectations, etc. Awards also stress the importance of human rights as a part of international law. Differences in methods or content from one legal order to another are not what counts. Arbitral case law, in fact, uh, reveals uh, an, uh, a work of inspiration, etc., and you have to focus on the systematic integration of Article 31, Paragraph 3 of the Vienna Convention or general international law, which is applicable. Now, of course, there are arbitral courts which have refused to have regard to any other human rights treaties than those ratified by the states concerned by arbitration. But the universal nature of the uh, values which are defended should preferably lead to a broader vision, which, uh, um, in fact, without having regard to the geographical scope of the treaty, uh, combined with uh, many principles, uh, within the meaning of Article 38, one of the statute of the ICJ. The case law of the European Court of Human Rights uh, plays a major role in ensuring consistency because unlike other instruments which protect fundamental rights, uh, the European Convention protects property and also applies to legal persons. Now, the ECHR uh, fulfills a constitutional mission in pursuing the objectives of democratic society, at least this is its goal. Arbitral case law recalls that awards delivered pursuant to, to an investment treaty only afford protection to investments and cannot punish, per se, a violation of human rights. 
Of course, the arbitrator's mission is not judicial reform, and uh, we can note the absence of the goal of social transformation in investment law. Undeniably, an arbitral tribunal does not uh, fulfill a constitutional mission like a national court or a regional human rights court. In the absence of a preliminary ruling mechanism, arbitral tribunals, be it in investment matters, international trade matters, etc., have recognized obstacles uh, to an action of the review of constitutionality by them. That should not prevent arbitrators from ascertaining whether a law of the host state claimed to be unconstitutional is, for the same reasons, uh, at odds with the values protected by the Investment Protection Treaty. The goal is not to put a stop to the violation of the Constitution of Fundamental Rights, but to draw conclusions uh, with regard to the failure to respect the treaty. The tendency to respect states should not prevail over violations of human rights, which at the same time can constitute a violation of the rights guaranteed by the treaty. The review bodies are not prohibited from also defending objectives and values in order to assess the validity of the awards brought before them. The absence of any reasoning in the award regarding the requirement, uh, uh, certain requirements, for example, pertaining to expropriation, and in particular, the requirement of legality regarding the right to expropriation, which should offer the possibility of challenging the measure in an adversarial debate. In short, everything which the Court of Human Rights has described as good governance obligations. An absence of reasoning regarding an internal procedure, etc., or again pertaining to a denial of justice, which might be the outcome of an administrative or a jurisdictional procedure, is not an error on the part of an arbitral tribunal, but a refusal to apply the Investment Protection Treaty, which has been disregarded. The violation of just Cogent's uh, norms is also a problem. And in the cases I have just mentioned, there is an excess of power. Uh, and it is not possible to disregard the universal nature of values defended by non-discrimination, access to justice, a fair trial, and legal certainty. The presence of these values in public or public policy can be explained in various ways, no matter what their source may be, constitutional law, general principles of law, human rights uh, principles, etc. The distinction between an international and transnational public order, which uh, case law has sometimes used, is not particularly interesting here. Although with uh, a universal notion, the benchmark is no longer national, but the content remains the same unless you find a difference with the domestic system. For the view, uh, sorry, for the review, The distortions of a rule do not count. What does count is the content of the rule and not the source which produces the rule. What is important is that the rule should be part of international public policy. When there is a doubt, as uh, legal teachings uh, suggest, but and a comparative approach is more promising. I'm not going to focus on the formal sources of law codes of conduct. It can highlight the emergence of legal standards, creating a strong common identity. Generally speaking, soft law accompanies the universal nature of fundamental rights and specifies the content of new rights, such as those pertaining to the environment. The mobilization of principles um, 
which are the subject of the broadest consensus, uh, strengthens the review of awards and uh, affords more legitimacy to the decisions taken by the review bodies. Um, the decisions taken by domestic and international courts also uh, provide the proof of the acceptance and recognition of an international norm as a peremptory norm. Uh, the international nature of review bodies does not that does not, sorry, necessarily predispose them to an international uh, outlook in their decisions, but can encourage them to go in that direction, provided they wish to contribute to a universal system of justice. They are elements of uh, communication, seeking more consistency, promoting objectives of common principles for a plurality of legal universes is only meaningful if the review bodies have uh, or wish to take part in the regulation of a universal system. A common language is only meaningful if one speaks to each other. I'm now going to stop. And uh, I would just like to say that I wanted to explain that the intervention of international law in a review is such as to strengthen its effectiveness and uh, how can you establish connections between various legal orders, which is the consequence of the plurality of the sources of law. But of course, for all of this to function properly, you need to have someone or a review body which is uh, willing to drew, draw conclusions from various legal systems. And I would now like to conclude. Um, we have seen the review of awards as a way of incorporating them into a domestic legal system. Is it necessary uh, to evolve towards a recognition by national legal orders, review no longer, in fact, incorporating decisions which cannot be allowed to order? This presupposes a more ambitious outlook than that of deciding about the fate of the award which is being challenged. But the decision has to be placed in the global context of the international system of uh, the res resolution of disputes by arbitration. Without the awareness and the will to take part in a common objective of the stabilization of international relations, decisions taken in other legal orders are reduced to mere anecdotes and will merely be a subject of curiosity. The refusal to consider the international dimension of rules and problems to be resolved is all the more paradox in legal systems which do not recognize the value of a president like my own, but would prefer to uh, confer to them a greater authority than that of uh, foreign decisions. If we can think, if we think of the mobilization by the courts of the common law of foreign precedents um, with a view to seeking the very best solution to resolve a dispute, we see that nothing is impossible. Principles are universal language. Their use should, uh, in fact, uh, make one take into consideration foreign decisions, regardless of whether the court of origin belongs to a specific legal tradition. But to that end, you need a certain degree of voluntarism uh, to uh, be able to speak to others. All uh, review bodies don't fulfill the same missions. Only those which are collaborative and work with arbitral justice uh, to strengthen the international dispute settlement uh, system, if need be, uh, through negotiation, can fulfill these goals. The networking of such courts can be the driving force uh, for the development of consistent global case law open to the influence of international law. But I'd like to say that, that this is a mission which would remain moot for many review bodies. In addition to correction, which might occur by distributing uh, arbitration seats, etc., there are two solutions offsetting shortcomings in the regulation of arbitral justice, which of course presupposes an awareness on their part. By setting up an outsourcing policy consisting in uh, 
delegating their disputes to the courts, which are the best place to, to deal with them and which are willing to act for the international community. And if the international division of work is not uh, suitable, then we will have to make do with leaving it up to each institution to evolve. Um, and on the basis of a comparison, which I borrow from another uh, expert, uh, some will proceed at the pace of a horse and cart, and others will proceed at supersonic speed. Thank you for your attention.